live all right then. Um, and yeah. people are, and people are joining all right lovely thank you very much um <clears throat> well hello everybody and um welcome to this webinar it's um really great that so many people are joining that's wonderful uh my name is pamela mason i'm a member of the just food group in abergavenny um, and we in the Just Food Group are very pleased to have um, been able to get Tim Lang um, to come and uh, talk to us this afternoon um, on the subject of Britain feeding itself. Uh, can Britain feed itself and does it matter if and how Britain feeds itself? Uh, I'm sure you all agree it's a very, very important question and has become even more important during the context of Covid. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask Tim to talk now. Um, as you'll see on his first slide, he's, um, he works at the Centre of Food Policy. Um, he's Professor of Food Policy at City University in London, where I had the great, where I had the great privilege to do an MSc now 10 years ago. Um, so Tim, as you appreciate, is, um, is one of the world's experts, um, and certainly in terms of Britain, Britain feeding itself. Um, is a UK expert in this topic. So welcome and thank you very much, Tim. Um, and um, uh, in terms of format, um, I'm asking Tim to speak for about 20 minutes um, and then we'll invite questions at the end. Okay, thank you, Tim. Okay, well, Pamela, you know me uh, well enough. If I start clearing my throat, I've usually spent three hours. Um, so I've, I've done about 29 slides for you and they're available for anyone if uh, you want to share them, Pam, afterwards uh, and Kim and Henry with anyone who wants them. Um, essentially, I've asked a question here. Uh, does it matter if and how Britain feeds itself? And I'd like to say very quickly, and you can go to sleep after this, the answer is yes and yes. I think it does matter. We know because agri-food systems, not just agriculture, but the food system entirely, uh, is a major contributor to health, uh, um, uh, uh, environmental implications, the shape of society. It's a key driver of the economy. Just look at what COVID-19 has done with the government, I think, cack-handedly, just closing hospitality sector for understandable reasons, but I said cack handedly because I think a lot of the skills and capacity could have been used in different ways. Um, uh, so we're dealing with a very complex system. Uh, now, what I am going to do is to try to see how I can move these slides. Let's go on to slideshow. Let's see if I can move it. Okay, can you all see that? You should see that better. Essentially, what I want us to do, and if I'd been there in Abergavenny, in the theatre as originally this was built, uh, if we were live, I would have loved to have had a debate with you and discussion and get your feelings about it. But it, essentially, I think there are two things that we need to debate. Um, we firstly need to accept, as I will show, that the UK doesn't feed itself, but we need to discuss, does it matter? Some people say, no, it doesn't matter, we're rich, we can buy imports, we can use other people, let them produce it. You've got sort of soft imperialist vision versions of that and hard right wing neoliberal versions of it. You know, why waste our time? Let's have cheap labor elsewhere and cheap land elsewhere do it. And the other answer is yes, it does matter precisely because of those things. We've got to at last grow up. We don't have an empire. Why do we assume others will feed us? Big moral discussions about that. But also, as I think I will show, land use problems and sustainability. It is completely bonkers to be uh, um, using Africa, for example, or Latin America to feed us. Uh, it's, we should be feeding ourselves and using our land as appropriately and sustainably as possible. The second question, is are there opportunities to change the UK food system? I think yes there are. Uh, COVID-19 adds uh, even more to the issues of Brexit and indeed part of the problem at the moment is the food system is caught in a sort of frozen moment, the, the famous rabbits caught in the headlights moment because we're uh, not dealing with Brexit and not dealing with COVID-19 uh, and not dealing with the massive inequalities in Britain. There's some rhetoric about it, but we're not dealing with the problems. 
Um, so yes, there are opportunities, we should be doing it, but are we doing it? No. Um, are there opportunities to change the UK food system? Some argue no, because it's very complicated to do it, even if we wanted to. It's, it's tricky, it's slow, people are wedded to what, eating what they want, they don't just change overnight, yet the data say we should be changing overnight. Well, actually the evidence is, um, and Pam knows this, in, in, in our masters at City University, where we try to discuss the issue about evidence-based policy, really the evidence is very strong. If you want to change a food system, have a crisis. But I mean, that's stupid. You don't want a crisis. But we are in a crisis. We're in a crisis of our making of ecosystems and public health. And we're sort of in a crisis about COVID-19 and how we're dealing with it. But we're also a lot of it's out of our control. But have we a crisis now? Yes, we have. And am I frustrated at the moment? Because I think Britain is not addressing that crisis through the lens of food at the moment. And in England, the Dimbleby process um, it keeps on being put back. It's begun, but uh, the Dimbleby national food strategy, we're now still waiting till after all the transition periods are done, when it's actually now we should be doing the transition. And yesterday's news, I'm sure you heard it, uh, that people like me were saying this three years ago to the government and they poo-pooed it. And now the entire road haulage industry is saying we're not prepared for the sudden no-deal Brexit. I mean, I think we've got a, a choice of crises, actually. And that, that partly that fits our problem of geopolitics. Okay, that's basically what I'm talking about. And I, I think I need to remind you, I mean, partly... Pam said I should mention this, I'm drawing upon a large amount of work I did for a book, uh, Feeding Britain, which came out the week of, uh, the, week of the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, um, published by Penguin in hardback, but it's coming out in paperback in February, because uh, it sold incredibly well, to my surprise. Um, uh, but essentially, if you, if you want to go into the detail of that, where I do go into that, Britain really doesn't have a food policy. It, it has bits here and there, but there's nothing coordinated in the way that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, and we've got bits in Wales, bits in Scotland, even less in England. Uh, uh, the right wing have blamed the European Union for that. Uh, the left wing haven't really engaged with it, but are beginning to. The Greens, probably of the only political position, has taken it very, very seriously. Um, and that's because in red on this slide, the default policy is let others feed ourselves. Uh, let an empire feed us, is what was decided in the European Cornwalls of 1846. The industrial capitalists wanted cheap food. Uh, and they said we can get cheaper food if we uh, lower the tariffs, lower the taxes on food coming into Britain, which were there uh, from after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. Uh, uh, and we could get cheaper food if we got the colonies to do it. Uh, we don't have any colonies. We haven't got an empire, but we still got that mentality. The other default policy is leave it to the market. Leave it to Tesco. In the lockdown, when people like me were tearing my hair out, um, trying to get some sanity and some food interventions, which we ought to have been doing under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, which I cover again in my book, um, well, the government's position was leave it to Tesco. And I've been arguing this for a long time, that's a default. Governments don't want to get their hands into the food system. They say, leave it to the efficiency of big market players. Uh, but they don't know what the framework is they should be addressing either. And then the other default policy is personal choice. It's up to you. Governments shouldn't be involved in food. It's your choice how you feed your kids or whether you die early from heart disease or from being obese and getting COVID-19. Um, I think this is nonsense. We live in a society in food. Even I, who have just eaten a very delicious soup uh, made partly from ingredients which, which I grew um, in, in my garden, um, I can't control what I take. We, we might think we're choosing our own food, but actually we're culturally determined, determined by class, by income, etc. So there's actually a myth of personal choice. So this void must be filled. Uh, now, I won't bore you with the sorts of things that I do in my work, but 
essentially the evidence is now overwhelming about these five bullet points. The ecosystems are highly stressed by food, by how we're dealing with food. Food's one of the biggest drivers of carbon emissions. Uh, it's the biggest user of water. It's the biggest destroyer of biodiversity. It's damaging soil, etc. Wherever you look in ecosystems, the message is not good. What can we do about it? Well, very conservative conservation bodies like um, World Wildlife Fund, WWF, are now knowing well, unless we shift to what Pam and I call sustainable diets, low carbon, but also healthy, etc., uh, we're not going to be able to resolve the problems of ecosystem damage, um, which is why the biggest conservation organization in the world, WWF, now makes sustainable diets one of its key goals worldwide to protect biodiversity. The food economy isn't paying the full cost. In Britain, the legacy of the 1846 uh, Corn Laws of uh, removing the tariffs with the Brits like to think good food is cheap. Well, actually, all we're doing is dumping the costs elsewhere onto the NHS, onto the environment, onto society, onto the economy, onto our bodies. Um, farming and food, the primary industries, farming and fishing, sorry, take very little of the money that we spend. We consumers in Britain spend a quarter of a trillion pounds every year. That's 225.7, to be precise, billions in last year was spent on food and, and soft drinks, non-alcoholic. Um, but yet farming and fishing only had about 8.6% of the gross value added of that. All the money goes off the land. Uh, the farming and fishing are tiny labor forces out of the 4.1 million people who work on food. Um, the food economy is distorted. I, I'm, I'm a social scientist. I'm particularly interested, as Pam knows, in food culture. You know, the ideas, the thinking, our, our beliefs about food. And frankly, I don't say this lightly, I think our British food culture is in fantasy land in some respects. We think we can eat anything we like, what, when, why, 24 hours a day, we expect to get it there, have it cheap, wrapped in plastic, and get what we like from it. Uh, and is it any wonder that we've got the damage from how we eat in the British diet, which is the most ultra-processed diet in Europe, the evidence is, so we're eating the most proportion of our food, which it comes in a form of high fat, high sugar, high salt, uh, um, and factory processed foods, what we call ultra processed foods. Uh, there's no wonder when you look at the advertising. The advertising spend by the British food industry is overwhelming for things like that, uh, rather than for fresh fruit and vegetables, and good things for, um, for food. And society is just totally divided. If you need any evidence to look at, just go and look at the Marmot Review. Professor Sir Michael Marmot, whom I know well, I was a visiting professor in his department, uh, and, and his cousin married a friend of mine, so I saw known socially as well as intellectually. But for, for decades, that department at the University College London has ploughed out the evidence, and now they're just utterly clear that one of the reasons of this enormous life expectancy gap between the bottom 10 or 20% of Britain and the top rich 20%, that's people like me who are professors and well paid, um, that gap is partly shaped by the diet that people eat. So this is not a good position. So when I set out to write my book, Feeding Britain, which is about food security, what do we mean about it? Uh, I essentially went and looked to say, okay, well, I think I know what the evidence says, but I then spent two years summarizing it, trying to get to grips with it. But here's what the, the Economist in, uh, Intelligence Unit says. It rates uh, the Global Food Security Index it produces every year. Britain, the sixth richest economy on the world, uh, comes only 17th uh, out of its measures of affordability, availability, quality, and safety. Those are pretty good, but they're not, I think Pam and I would like more measures than that. And if they include environment in that, the bottom right hand, they do another, uh, the EIU does another index, the sustainability index. Britain drops to 24th out of the 67. Basically, uh, where our food system is damaging our ecosystems and, and emitting far too many ecosystems um, stresses, uh, 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 for us to be able to say we're food secure, we're not. Now, this term food security is used a lot 
the beginning of my book partly addresses this, I think we have to start unpicking it to a literate audience like Epigreni Food uh, Festival people. You know, uh, this is in one slide, but actually I try to explore, have we got these notions? Are we food nationalists? Do we want to produce just all our own food? Bye bye olives, bye bye avocados, bye bye peaches, bye bye wine, well, except to be expensive from the south of England. Um, do we mean food defense? Uh, I think that is actually very important. Can you protect your food supply? What's the point of having a state if it can't ensure that all of its people are well fed and sustainably so? And at the moment, the British state is failing. That's my argument in my book. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think we're breaking our own uh, military traditions, believe it or not, and we're out of control when it comes to very, very serious potential disruptions of food supplies through uh, um, 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 data management and, uh, and basically the internet uh, and satellites and things. The entire logistic systems of food runs through satellites. It's pretty easy to take them out, actually. Uh, and I don't think we're taking that seriously. Uh, food control and so on. The, the, this notion of food resilience, the fourth from the bottom, is really important because this notion has come from actually stress specialists saying a capacity of a system to bounce back after a shock. Uh, and this is actually very critical for us to get our heads around here. If you really want to get more information about that, my book really tries to unpick what do we mean by that. So. We use the notion of food security and it means different things to different people. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but I just, if anyone wants to understand Britain and its food system and why we are where we are, why messy uh, food policy is so messy, you have to understand our history. And just here are some examples, I mean, of key moments. And, and in a sense, leaving Europe uh, is, is a really big wake up call. Uh, we're actually leaving Europe just when it's beginning to address uh, some of these broad dimensions of food security and sustainability that I want. And we're all over the place at the moment uh, and separating food from these issues uh, when in fact Europe is plowing ahead. And the great, great irony of where we are. But um, now we've got coronavirus. Uh, just to remind you, in 1939, um, a book uh, which inspired me 45 years ago when I picked it up for 10p in a junk shop in Leeds where I was doing my PhD. Um, this was um, uh, Lord Walton's map when he came in as a minister of food. Uh, here's, you know, I, I often said to be the inventor of food miles, which I sort of did. Um, uh, this is just to show you, it wasn't me who invented it really, it was Lord Walton. Uh, they were wanting to know where does food come from and he said, he had this map above his desk, just to remind him, Britain was in a seriously risky situation because it, it didn't even feed itself. Well, there's nothing new here. Uh, here's the current figures. Our uh, supply, we were basically about 80% self-sufficient in the early, early 80s. On this left-hand graph, I've uh, got it from uh, uh, 18, uh, 1987 to last year. It's dropped. Um, uh, uh, actually, it depends how you measure it, whether you measure it by tonnage or by percentage. Um, overwhelmingly, we're getting the food from uh, the European Union, and we're saying we're going to go out of the European Union. If you aren't following it, let me just tell you the current estimates. So that if we crash out, fruit and vegetables will go up by 30%. Uh, in prices. Uh, uh, here's how the food comes on the left. It basically comes in lorries and containerized, overwhelmingly through the Channel Tunnel and Dover. These are in my food defense theme in my book. Um, I don't know if you know, but I found out there is a private police force there of 300 people, uh, which is Eurotunnel's um, uh, parent company's police force. We have not much control over it. Um, uh, and uh, just look at where those, <laughs> how important they are. Um, uh, and it comes in different ways, containerized, loose, uh, through Harwich and Felixstone, for example, a lot of loose grain comes. Britain doesn't even produce all of its own grain. Um, but this is a critical issue. 
in, from the economic point of view, there is what we call the food trade gap that's risen dramatically. Literally, we're now about 24 billion pounds every year in, in negative. So in other words, we're importing far more food than the whiskey and biscuits that, and, and, and meat that we export. Uh, and if you look at it by commodity, you can look at all of these later. You can see on the right hand side, I don't know if you can all see, Pam, tell me if you can. They're all in negative. Basically, in none of them are we anywhere near like equal in terms of imports and exports. That's not been self-sufficient, that's just imports and exports, financial terms, except for beverages, and that's whiskey. It's basically whiskey, which is the only thing um, uh, uh, that goes into our mouths uh, in which Britain is anywhere near um, um, economically solvent. Um, and part of my point of accepting the invitation, which uh, I was very grateful to doing this virtually, um, uh, was because I really want to pose this. What's our vision? Is our vision to be the 51st state of the US? Well, there are a lot of people in the Conservative Party who want that. Some people in the Labour Party, I think, want it, but I don't know. But there are implications from all of these. If we're Atlanticists, if we're globalist, some people say, well, we'll get food from anywhere. It'll just be the cheapest. And that's okay. Well, then it has a knock-on effect for food defense. It has a knock-on effect for how, how much control do we have over that. And that's why issues like food standards are so important in trade deals. I've been uh, working very heavily, as Pam knows, uh, over the last uh, three and a half uh, years since the referendum and before that as well, saying, look, the implications if we leave the EU is you lose control over where you get your food from and you're reliant upon supply lines providing the only regulations that you have. So corporate control replaces state control. So these are different models of what we are. Are we, do we want to be nationalists to only have Britain producing its food and being self-reliant? Or are we, as the bottom uh, row puts, just really not bothered? We'll just get the food from anywhere and I'm not bothered about this. And partly, partly, the reason I say I will do a talk like this for you is because I don't want that to happen. If people really aren't bothered about where their food comes from, they need to wake up about the implications that happen. And this is partly why uh, we've got to change. As again, Pam knows, I spent three and a half years of my life from 2016, actually a bit before that, to 2019 on the very famous now Eat Lancet Commission. The Medical General of the Lancet throws people like me in a room, 12 or 18 or so, and says, come up with the answer to a problem. And the answer we, the question we were posed was, can we feed the world healthily by 2050 uh, without destroying the ecosystems? Uh, to be honest, I thought the answer would be no. Uh, but our answer was yes, um, but it requires big dietary change. Uh, and if you're interested in that, all the modeling is, is there, and it's a hugely cited report, raised lots of hackles in some quarters. Uh, yesterday I was talking to the entire dairy industry of the world, who obviously, uh, partly wanted, <laughs> weren't very happy with me, but they also partly accept that this is what the data say, and it's not just the Eat Lancet Commission that comes up with this. And you can look at these. Whether we like it or not, ruminant meat is a major uh, pouring out source of greenhouse gases. It's a major user of land use. It's a major user of energy, and so on. Um, and the more you go towards plant foods, and this uh, figure is looking at environmental effects per serving of food. The more you go to plants, the lower the damage. Doesn't mean to say there's zero damage. You can have a really wrecking horticulture and you can have a much more benign horticulture. So there are choices to make. You can have grass-fed beef or you can have intensively reared, indoor, uh, tethered, uh, cereal-fed uh, beef. Uh, and and the figures will vary. But whatever the mode of production of beef or pork or chicken or fish, the damage is greater than when you go over to things like nuts and soybeans. But on nuts, for example, Californian almonds are catastrophic when we look at water use. Uh, 
Um, we're in Wales. I'm actually talking to you from Anglesey, so we're in Wales. And this is a, the cumulative study, lovely series done by uh, McHuntleth by the Centre for Alternative Technology. It's a really serious bit of intellectual work they did over about five years. And this is a report that came out beginning of this year. Uh, if you look at the orange, currently, this is land use in Britain. Uh, very little of land use is for food for us. If we wanted to be zero carbon on the right hand side, we've got to double it. I agree with that. That's basically what the Lansing Commission said as well, the Lansing Commission said as well. Here's what UK land use is at the present. On the left from the Committee on Climate Change, um, we've got about 18 million hectares in Britain. Um, most of it is unusable, uh, it's sort of wild. Um, uh, about a quarter is cropland, uh, about a third is um, uh, grassland and so on. Very little is horticulture. If we go over, I've got the English figures, forgive me, I couldn't find the Welsh figures. The English figures for horticulture are tiny, if you look, it's about 3%. Uh, and here I've put them, the, the national figures, I'm talking UK national as opposed to the, uh, the four countries. Um, here's the 18, 18.7 million hectares are available in Britain. Croppable, in other words, where we do something to uh, nominally feed us or do something for us, it's about a third of that 6 million. Within that, there's precisely 165,000 hectares. It's tiny, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny. We've got to increase that. Uh, uh, to grow things that we could grow. What on earth is the point of importing apples or pears from halfway around the world when we can grow them here? Absolute idiocy. Uh, here's another way of looking at it, hectares. Uh, um, uh, these are all from DEFRA figures and UK uh, ONS figures. Um, I, I talked a lot about biodiversity and health and so on, but I'm, you know, here we are in Wales, it's wet, Britain is wet, actually it's not wet in parts, um, southeast of England is in water stress already. Um, um, when you start looking at uh, um, what we call virtual water or import embedded water in foods, you get a really interesting understanding of, 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 of the hidden uh, ingredients in our food. And the UK, this is lovely studies done by Tim Hess and colleagues at Cranfield, um, which I really rate. Um, uh, just look at those figures. We're just importing huge amounts of water, bottom right figure, from countries which are water stressed. I mean, my tone of voice goes up. Now, as Pam knows, I was a child in India. So my, my dad was working there. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it is extraordinary that actually India is doing a kind of version of, of serving the empire by feeding things to us uh, and we've got to start looking in terms of social justice very much about whether we're taking other people's water. That's a big discussion and hard figures. Um, uh, let's look at the role of the state. Part of my argument is that frankly the state is sleepwalking into failing to address this I think it's beginning a little bit to address some of these issues, uh, but not enough. Just look at where the priorities are. We've got nearly 40 billion pounds, 39.5 billion pounds spent in this financial year, or sorry, the last financial year by the Ministry of Defence on, on, on aircraft carriers that uh, you know, haven't got uh, aircraft. And um, uh, as I show in my book, we have, I think, 17 um, little, little boats for protecting um, uh, the Border Control Force, uh, uh, and, and DEFRA uh, has uh, not even two billion. Um, the priorities are bizarre, how they're uh, both within the budgets and between the budgets. Uh, and this sort of thing I'm interested in. Um, when we look globally, this is from the uh, Eat Lancet, we've got to increase the vegetable production worldwide by about 75%, by fruits by 50%. We've got to reduce red meat production by about 65%, increase legumes and nuts and so on. That's the global picture. It's not saying in Wales this can be done, but it's saying we've, we can't just say, oh, well, Wales is about sheep 
and, and Welsh black cattle. I used to be a pedigree breeder of Welsh black cattle. I think they're lovely, but it's ludicrous to be having cattle in Wales then fed by cereals that are imported or, or pigs in Wales or poultry in Monmouthshire um, uh, fed on grains and soy imported in other ways. This is maybe trying to make money for the farming, but is it sustainable? Is it good land use? No, it isn't at all. Um, the diet change uh, 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 for consumers is a very big factor in this. That's not up to farming, but farming's got to try and address the need to alter diets and to respond to altered diets over the next 20, 30 years and do it rapidly. Just to explain this, the bottom is UK diet is UKD, flexitarian diets, pescatarian diets, vegan diets, sort of vegetarian diets, sorry, and vegan diets on the right. Uh, if you change the diet, this is modeling we did, the Lancet for, for just for the UK, we did follow-up work, uh, Marco Springman at Oxford uh, 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 did this for us. Um, you find then the nitrogen use, the phosphorus use, and so on starts being altered. Uh, but fresh water use may go up with a vegan diet, actually. Um, um, now, just throwing it in, um, uh, you know, what's the point of land? Well, I'll tell you the answer of land, and land is, is capital. Land is there, um, as land continues to be sold, prices, look, the prices continue to rocket up over the last 20 years. Um, and, and who owns it? seems to me an extremely important issue that's got to be debated. And, and if we were there for the afternoon, we could discuss it. But there's a big issue about, you know, what's the church doing with its, with its land? Uh, are, you know, I've walked, you know, several times over very large aristocratic land holdings. I'm just reading um, Nick Hayes' amazing book about trespass. Um, uh, which is a very hard line, sort of George Monbiot position, but really it's very beautifully written. Uh, and I have done a couple of things that he talked about. You know, I've walked over vast acreages, which are the lawns of stately homes, and you think, this should be horticulture. This is ludicrous, and I've said so to the owners. Um, but farming in Britain, the reality is it's held alive by subsidies. These are the subsidy figures of what we call in my world the TIF figures, the total income from farming figures. They go up, they go down, those are the blue bars. Uh, but it's the subsidy, the red line, uh, that keeps farming afloat. If we remove the subsidy, the Common Agricultural Policy subsidy, about three billion pounds, which the government wants to do, wants to get rid of it, uh, and, and replace it with some ecosystem subsidies, well, British farming actually goes bankrupt. Great slabs of it, not all of it, and not just small farms, actually, very early, you'll be surprised which farms are going to be here. Some big ones and some, some medium-sized ones go to the wall. They're just not having up. And I'm talking a lot at the moment to analysts who are doing that work. It's really interesting. Um, here's the National Audit Office. You can look at this. I'll skip over it. The profitability and the reliance on subsidies varies remarkably by different modes of production. Uh, and you can look at this later. And this, this is from... Uh, uh, the, the excellent work done by Dr. Jason Bidell and colleagues at Stratton Parker, big land agents, I and mean, then really interesting work. Um, this is uh, borrowed from Pam's and my books, Sustainable Diets, that we read together over about two years, um, came out in 2017. Um, essentially, how do we deal with this complexity? Uh, our argument, Pam and I tried all sorts of ways of trying to gather this complexity, this complex view, multiple bodies of evidence, all saying we've got to change this and change that, and how do we put them together? And essentially we went back in the end to something that I'd helped develop when I was a government commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission, responsible for land use and, 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 and food, basically that the coalition government abolished when it came in in 2010. But this was the last report that came out in 2011 under my, uh, my leadership, uh, and, and we modified it. Essentially, this is, a, if you've got one minute with Mark Drayford uh, or uh, the Minister of Health, you can say, look, your job is to fit into this matrix, your health, or your environment. Uh, but unless we're dealing with all of these 
And if you look later at the little writing under the big headings, you're not going to be moving either production or consumption, uh, let alone both of them, in the right direction. So it's getting those together is what a proper food policy for Britain uh, would need to do. And only if we do that, is my argument, will we be able to uh, begin to address food security in the way that uh, I was raising. So to return to the question that I asked and give my answers, I think it does matter how we feed ourselves. It does matter where food comes from. And in one slide here, I put some of the headline points uh, in red that I think come out and then in after the arrows what that means. So in supply, Britain really ought to be growing more, not at all costs, not you know, covering the world with plastic uh, and greenhouses or plastic greenhouses. They have a place, but as long as the plastic is recyclable and usable. Uh, what are we doing with land use? There is a really strong case for more land for trees and for wilding, less for uh, farm animals. Uh, there is a really good case, as Pam and I know, for sustainable dietary guidelines. Uh, there is no guidance to consumers of how to juggle health, environment, social values. And that's why your group, uh, the social justice group, is so important because I think those arguments are beginning to engage and connect nutrition with ecosystems and, and the economy and so on. Um, uh, and I think we need more horticulture. Uh, and there is a crisis of skills and training. Another very good person uh, living just down the road from you and up in Valley, Sue Pritchard is leading the uh, uh, food, uh, the, uh, the, the Countryside Commission, the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, uh, which has come up with really excellent and interesting reports from its two year process. And that's now got um, further life funded by um, uh, a big foundation. Um, we've got to be thinking about skills and training. It's one of the things at the end of my book I think is really important. Uh, but one of the critical issues for me as an analyst was food infrastructure. Um, I, I read, I bet not many of you know of, let alone read their reports of the Infrastructure Commission. This is charged to look 50 years ahead. I mean, if global warming continues at a pace as it seems to be doing, great slabs of where what food is that's healthy as grown in Britain will go underwater. We've got to be relocating horticulture. We've got to be rethinking, can we use motorways uh, as a global uh, and indeed European trunk uh, systems, uh, motorway systems to delivering food? Should we be having a more bioregional approach to food, which is what I think we should be doing? Um, because I think that's more resilience. It starts ticking the resilience box and it revitalizes local economies. But that needs civil awareness. Uh, and you might not be aware of what resilience forums are, but these were set up under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, which really ought to be addressing food. Indeed, has a statutory duty to be dealing with food, but is not doing so. How many of you are aware of your local food resilience, your resilience forum? And, and if you are, does it do anything about food or civic preparation? We'll go to Sweden and they got advice about uh, domestic stockpiling and being prepared for crises and preparing uh, um, the citizenship for being able to look after themselves in a socially egalitarian way. And Britain's not doing that at all. No wonder we had problems with stockpiling uh, when COVID-19 hit the first time. It's because that was created to cause social dissent. Uh, it, you couldn't have invented it more stupidly than we did. So it's a big picture I'm throwing at you, uh, but I think we now know how to navigate through this complexity, but it really just needs political will, and that's why I, I wish we could be talking longer than we've got. That's it, Pam. All right. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, really, um, as usual, for um, a great big picture view um, of food security, food security in Britain. Um, and um, you very well answered the question. 
uh, as far as you're concerned that yes we do need to become more secure yes we do need to produce more of our own food um, and I think Covid for me Covid has, has, has highlighted that ever more strongly as indeed has Brexit um, in your, um, I'm going to ask for questions in a moment, so if people will be ready with some questions, uh, you can either wave a hand or, um, or type a question in the chat room. Um, for me, amongst that eight bullet point conclusion that you reached, um, I have a nutrition background, as, as, as many people will know. Um, and um, uh, the food system, for me, has to be able to produce healthy food. In fact, that's a focus that we really haven't so strongly had food for public health. I mean, that is, that's absolutely vital. And of course, that food production has to make money. Of course it has to, the, to, those, to those who produce the food. So food for public health um, and sustainable dietary guidelines, of course, to, to guide and um, provide the advice and the information, uh, not just for the public uh, consuming the food, but also for, um, for politicians and for guiding food policy, uh, further food policy. Um, so um, yes, food for public health, I think, is uh, is my big is, is my big uh, my big strand as far as that's concerned. And uh, in producing food for public health, of course, it also has to be ecologically sustainable. Um, so um, just thinking in terms of the of the phrase, which is um, very well known in my mind, and that's eco nutrition. Um, so we need ecologically produced food. Um, and that food um, must do good for public health. Um, and I think as Tim has, um, has covered very well in his presentation, we just simply don't have that at the moment. Uh, with the result that the NHS has got a big bill around diet related disease uh, and the environment um, has got a big bill around resource use, water use, land use and so on. So yeah, big problems, um, big problems and which Tim has outlined very well for us. Uh, and at the end of his talk with some solutions, we do now know what to do. As he said, it's lack of political will. All right, so um, it's over to you now. If anybody's got any questions, um, I think I've seen one in the chat room already from uh, Kim Waters, Chief Exec of the Food Festival. Um, and Tim, if I could put the questions to you, um, you, I think, can also see them. Um, so the first question there from Tim Waters um, about meat um, and what's the range of results of meat regeneratively produced versus factory farming and what would you expect the rich, the rich pasture land say of the Ox Valley? Um, I'll mute myself. Okay. Um, I, I was just beginning to type an answer, but I'll say it. Um, basically, sustainably produced or more grass-fed beef, um, uh, grass-fed meat and dairy uh, the output takes longer, uh, it doesn't necessarily resolve the greenhouse gas emissions in quite the same way as you'd expect, because the animals um, take longer before they become mature, or um, they, they, they don't produce as much milk if it's dairy. So it's not as clear-cut an answer, Kim, as you might have been hoping for. Um, it, essentially, the, at the global level, indeed it applies to Britain as well, is the problem is rising numbers of cattle. Um, even if they all go more grass fed, um, which is desirable in terms of you know, ethics and, uh, and, and, and other criteria of sustainability, if there are more of them, the picture doesn't improve. Um, uh, and to some extent, that is where at the global level, the evidence points. Um, the, the, the dairy industry that I was talking with yesterday you know, they know that they, they've, they've got to get their act together much better. But as I kept on pointing out to them, if, if you're continuing to grow the industry and take uh, dairy production to parts of the world where they don't have dairy, you know, Asia particularly, China, they're turning them into dairy consumers. Um, this is catastrophic. Or, you know, the country I live in as a child, India, you know, where... Um, majority Hindu um, country, they don't eat, eat the cattle because they're gods, they have very strict um, moral positions on it, uh, but it's now the biggest dairy herd on the planet. Um, so, okay, and, and, the, and the Ask Valley, you can say, yes, the, the more grass-fed the cattle are, the better, 
Um, but is that going to resolve the problem of cattle and their impact in Britain? The answer is no, a little bit. Um, there's actually some very interesting evidence coming out now, experiments and studies that have been done of, of upland farms, uh, of saying that they, they, you know, you go on to really high farms in Britain and the, they've got huge sheds and they've got the animals in there and they're buying in feed. Uh, and this is now increasingly being seen as just a hopeless treadmill. And in fact, the profitability returns if they completely reverse that. They don't buy in anything. They don't try to improve pasture. They don't try to use fertilizer. They don't buy expensive inputs, but they actually only do what the land can deliver. And then the profitability goes up. Um, so I don't know enough about the Usk Valley to know whether that answers all the issues. But to summarize it in one sentence, there's no one quick fix that deals with the problem of the growth of cattle. We've got to just reduce them. Reduce the sheep, reduce the cattle is good news all round. It's terrible for the farming. That's why it's very important you know. I'm not saying that as some snotty overnight, although I am, I live in London, or I'm on Anglesey at the moment for domestic reasons um, with family. Um, uh, you know, I, I was a dairy farmer and I really pedigree worse black cattle and I rear sheep and done everything. Um, so I'm not saying it as some snotty, uh, you know, fantasist who thinks, you know, a burger or something comes from a vegan factory and that's the answer to everything. Um, we've got to live simpler, eat simpler diets, have meat as feast day foods, uh, not have dairy fats all the time. I increasingly, in fact, I haven't had this conversation with you, Pam. I'm beginning to think, could a cultural rule be that milk is a, a summer a summer crop uh, when the grass is growing and the dairy is a winter crop uh, that sorry cheese is a winter crop i mean how can we think what how do we think of new cultural rules that's the sort of thing we've got to start exploring to to replace this eat anything culture that we've got yeah yeah thanks uh, i've got a couple of questions here which are related to horticulture um I'll actually take both of Patrick's questions. These are both questions from Patrick Hanney, who is a member of Just Food and also leads Abergavenny Transition Town. Um, Patrick's asked uh, about horticulture and capacity being so low, and what would most powerfully ramp up capacity and over what time scale? Um, yeah, and he that's also asks, which is uh, linked in with that, um, he's also asked, Monmouthshire has such good quality farmland. Yes, indeed, it does. It's got a lot of, it does, lots yeah. of high quality farmland, uh, like Anglesey, indeed. Um, and aren't we wasting it in Wales, allowing it to be so focused on cattle and sheep and feeding them? And how do we shift that quickly? So, um, yes, it's about shifting shifting the food production system in Wales. Well, I'll, I'll, grasp, I'll grasp the horns of uh, the dilemma, Pam. Um, uh, a lot depends on the economics of it. And that's why I think there's a very interesting debate and you're a very literate audience. Um, you, you'll know this, some of you better than me, um, about what's often called regenerative agriculture or even rewilding and, and um, um, shifting what we grow on the land that we've got. Um, all of that is good. I think where at a very interesting place in Britain. And uh, uh, while I'm extremely nervous about the cack-handed way that Brexit's been dealt with so far, um, I think we have to try and make the best of it and best of where we are. Um, and part of that, I think, has just got to be experimentation, uh, which is why I think one of the critical issues, and I know you, you're part of this, this group is part of that, uh, is about rebuilding a regional identity, a much more local identity, trying to close loops to shorten supply chains, to encourage the daring person who sets up a horticultural enterprise in, uh, 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 in Monmouthshire. Uh, would it be possible to do that? Well, then you meet the brick wall of supermarkets and their mass purchasing contracting systems. Um, and for 25 years, we've had this experiment in alternative food networks, as it's called by the academics. Um, 
it's interesting, it's sort of worked, but it's still very marginal. It's not big enough, it hasn't got lift off. Um, and part of the pressure that's building up in England on Henry Dimble Bay and the National Food Strategy of England is to try and raise the game there. But the reality, the political reality right now is that the government completely happy to hand over responsibility to nine retailers. I mean, I was leaked by someone at the meeting in, of, of cabinet people with, um, with the, the food industry at the beginning of when COVID-19 lockdowns were happening and, and the first couple of months, you know, the, the Secretary of State was just saying in those meetings, let's leave it to the retailers, leave it to Tesco. He didn't use those words, but he said, leave it to the rest of the retailers. Uh, they'll sort it. That we don't need to worry about it. They'll sort it. Uh, and, and the argument is, they did. But there's devastation everywhere else with the alternative food networks, with all the big supplies that went to the, the hospitality industry, which accounted for 30% of all food consumed in Britain. So, uh, you know, it, it's too easy to say that there's an easy economic model to replace what we've got at the moment. I think there's just got to be more political demand for more regional food systems. It's going to be critical to regenerative agriculture being economically viable. And we're going to have big battles over the substitute replacements. That's why I put that stuff in my talk. If you're not aware of that, the plan was to get rid of subsidies by 2026. It's catastrophic to Britain. And, and, but then people are buying land because it doesn't, as Mark Twain famously said, or as the legislature said, they don't make it anymore. So people are buying land. Um, you know, the Dyson vacuum cleaner billionaire, you know, has bought, I think, 30,000 acres of my, where I was born in Lincolnshire. Um, great, but, you know, really? What, what does that power do? What is it about producing food or being a hedge for his family? Um, we've got to do some very serious discussions about what land is for and how the economic signals can be dealt with differently. And in Wales, that's about sheep. You know, Welsh farmers voted for Brexit and then said, oh my God, <laughs> France is where our sheep go. Well, wake up, wake up now. The, you know, the music is stopping. You're gonna have to sit down on chairs that are no longer there. So some big thinking is gonna be needed. Your group, social justice group and the Abergavenny sort of movement of progressive food movement that it, it represents is absolutely in the thick of it there. You're in a very tricky area where you're gonna to have to try and encourage new avenues of hope and new experimentation. So I go back to where I started in my answer to the question. I think it's a period of experimentation, but also the political lobbying. There has to be lobbying of your MPs to make sure the arguments about the subsidy replacements are dealt with well. And for people over in the Welsh border, uh, that becomes very important for the, uh, uh, the members of Senate. Son of politics is going to be really important. Yeah, Tim, if I can just take another question. You mentioned, um, yeah, just the terrific fallout of, of COVID and as far as uh, what we've really seen, what's really come out in, in uh, very, very starkly to me about COVID is the, is the desperate food inequalities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that just brings me to another question um, from, uh, from Jeremy, who, is, uh, who chairs the, the, uh, the Just Food Group in Abergavenny. And Jeremy is asking, how do we address food poverty and ensure fair incomes for producers? Um, so <sighs> fairness for both consumers and producers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why I put up, some people sort of uh, get irritated. Well, actually, government, a chief economist once from the government wrote to me saying, why do you keep on saying that farmers get no money? They get a lot of money. I said, well, look at it. How did the proportion that the farming and fishing folk get of the primary producers of what consumers spend is peanuts, frankly. Um, in my book, I end up saying, well, why shouldn't we aim for doubling of that? Shorter food chains, one of the good things about it is uh, the opportunity arises for getting more money to go to the primary producers. Um, but to address uh, Jeremy's question, um, well, yesterday I was on BBC You and Yours programme uh, having to comment on a harrowing tale of a young woman who lost her job and lost her income and just catastrophe economically altering uh, 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 what she and her child and her family could eat after the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, 
you know, the government was again not prepared for this. People like me were saying before the lockdown, saying we ought to have uh, under resilience forums, that's why they should be so important, an, an equitable system of ensuring that all people have enough income to be able to afford a sustainably produced diet. That is what a civilized society would do. We've actually left food to be the leftover of incomes uh, after rents and rates and TVs and telephones and transport or children's um, clothes are taken out. Food is the flexible item in the budget. And that's always the problem. It gets squeezed. So there's a real incentive for people on low incomes to go for the cheapest food. The cheapest foods tend to be the ultra processed ones, salty, fatty, and sugary. And then, hey, presto, are we surprised when the income gap leads to a health and life expectancy gap? The answer is no. Uh, what can be done about this? Well, at a draconian level, universal credit ought to be including um, a, a doubling of uh, expenditure on food for people on low incomes so that they can do it. There's a, a pretty draconian way of doing it, of having fruit and vegetable vouchers. Uh, that's what happened in rationing in the Second World War. You could get as many fruit and vegetables as you like. It was unregulated. Uh, it, it was unrationed, but other foods were rationed. We put no energy into thinking through how we can alter the gap between the rich and the poor. I think that should be happening. To his credit, Henry Dimbleby does acknowledge that problem in his part one of the National Food Strategy Report, the English Food Strategy Report, but we're still not seeing any response uh, from the government to, uh, to, to that recognition. The short answer, Jeremy, is more money for people on, who are poor, uh, but there are other fixes that could be done. I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy about that because I think it drives a wedge between the rich and the poor. If the poor are being told uh, what to eat, whereas everyone else isn't being told, which is why people like Pam and I argue for sustainable dietary guidelines for all. And then you cost that. You cost it in Monmouth. You cost it in Abergavenny. You cost it in London. And you'll cost differently in different parts of the country. Uh, and then you have incentives for people to produce food to meet those guidelines. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that thinking in um, you know, some of the, the uh, school meals improvement programs that have gone on. Uh, the, the Soil Association's Food for Life system, I've actually been a great fan of that. I think it's been a huge success. Um, but what we're not doing is taking that sort of experimentation and, and writing it large into uh, society as a whole without making it like old style school meals where everyone knew who the kid was who was in receipt of the free school meals. Uh, there is a problem of stigma there. Actually, as Pam and I know only too well, the richer you are, the more fruit and vegetables you might be consuming in Britain, but actually even the rich aren't consuming enough. Uh, it's a, a catastrophically bad position uh, of Britain. Um, uh, so I, I see general public messages and general provision and general change of consumption as having to address the problem of food poverty, not just targeting measures on the poor. I'm always nervous about that. And uh, if, I hope I don't offend any of you. I think food, the rise of food banks and the reliance on food banks is actually a sign of how low Britain is stepping. Uh, we've institutionalized charity, whereas in fact the welfare state was about getting rid of charity. And we've forgotten our own history. And it's going to take years to undo this damage. And of course, there's a wing of the Conservative Party that's incredibly happy about charity. They want you to feel bad. They want you. It's all about the deserving, the undeserving poor. It's been a deliberate strand of social policy to make life hard so that you go to work for low wages. Uh, but how low do they go? You know, we look at what's emerged in COVID-19. It's been known for years in Leicester. Uh, you know, people working for £3.50 an hour. How do you get cheap clothes to boo or pretty little things? 
You know, the answer is you exploit the labor. It's either exploited in India or Bangladesh, or it's being exploited by Asian extraction uh, entrepreneurs of Asian extraction workers in Leicester. Uh, and then you get a squeeze on what they can afford to eat. And then you'll start seeing the differences in life expectancy. So these are, as I described in my Feeding Britain book, really difficult lock-ins, what we call in policy lock-ins. You know what the problem is, but you can't do anything about it because it requires other things to happen, which is why we end up talking about the need to alter the food system. So I want the people on low incomes, poverty and inequality to be one of the drivers of making a better food system, but not targeting the poor. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, another two or three very interesting questions there, which I'm not going to have time to cover, I'm afraid, about um, how best can all our sheep farmers be encouraged to move to more sustainable food production. Yeah, thank you, Maurice, for that question. And another one from Patrick Hanney about lab meat and sheer uh, investment um, that's going um, uh, in, uh, in big venture capital into lab-based meat. Um, is it all fantasy? Um, or not. Um, it depends how much more time we, uh, you know, we really want to be online discussing those, uh, discussing those further questions. Very, very interesting. Um, I mean, perhaps Tim, um, you could, um, uh, you could sort of in part wrap up answers to those questions by, um, I mean, I'd just like you to sum up really, just bring this back. Yeah, to well, I'll, 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 I'll do that. Just bring it Sorry, or, or sorry, maybe, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say maybe, maybe you could answer those separately, um, and we could we could get we could get the answers to um, to the people who've asked those questions. Oh, I'll try and answer. I'll, I've been giving you long answers because they're great questions. Yeah, they are and great they, questions. I don't want to ignore them. Uh, these, are the not, they are, these are not simple things. Um, um, if I take Kim's to all panelists, GHG guru would dispute some of this. Yeah, well, tough. Sorry, the data <laughs> spoke. The data are the data. Um, Patrick, you say you haven't mentioned lab meat, urban vertical farms. No, I haven't. I haven't mentioned lots, actually. Um, this, uh, I've, I've tried to, and forgive me speaking fast and being very dense, but this is a huge issue. Uh, we can't, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of unraveling. Um, I haven't mentioned lab meat. I see lab meat as a complete side issue, to be perfectly, perfectly honest. Um, I think a sort of meat-like uh, plant-based substitutes are, are perhaps more interesting, um, but uh, they are often, it's a bit like having artificial sweetness replacing sugar. You still have the, the junkie like bizarre that you're going to have sweet diet. Um, it's not altogether the right metaphor, but it's not far off. Um, I don't see lab meat as important. I think, uh, in fact, as an experiment yesterday, I ate a vegetarian sausage. It was actually disgusting. I thought the taste just was awful. Um, uh, but I think encouraging people not to eat meat is a very good thing. But actually, diversity of diet doesn't need to be replaced by plant-based meat substitutes. Urban vertical farms is interesting. It's a bit like allotment gardening. I, I, I'm president of the Organic Gardeners. Um, I used to be an organic farmer, but I'm president of the Organic Gardeners in Britain. Uh, and I'm very keen and very supportive, and there are nine million gardeners in Britain. But if you look at the, the estimates of how much food comes from gardens, it's tiny, it's one, two percent. Um, you've got to have a pretty big garden for it really to make a difference to how much of a percentage of your household intake it re represents. Uh, urban vertical farms are interesting mainly because what they do is they turn buildings into um, production sites. Um, uh, and they're also more local. Uh, they, they have shorter transportation routes. They can be quite high energy, but mostly they use LED lights. Um, they're mostly used for very quick, high value added foods, mostly for the hospitality sector, you know, um, little fancy pea, pea, pea sprouts and things like that, um, which are garnishes on meals. 
um, that tends to be how they're used at the moment. Uh, really, we've got to go back to the urban-rural connections. It's one of the reasons, and please look at it, Patrick, in my book, uh, I end up just, I, I find it interesting in, 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 in thinking about the book, I find myself more and more drawn to the inevitable logic that bio, what, what we call bioregionalism has to be a way to think about food in the future. If you can get foods as local, uh, all the better. But if your Worcestershire apple has gone to some packing station off the M1 north of London and then comes back, well, that's not really local food. Um, the, the shorter, shorter supply chains and shorter chains are a good thing. Um, they're not fantasy, but are they going to feed big cities like Birmingham or Manchester or London or Glasgow? No. Can they be useful symbolically? Yes. Do they have a role with something like mushrooms underground? Yes, they do. Um, they have a place, but they still don't get over the fundamental problems I was trying to raise in my book, and Eat Lancet does, and countless big reviews worldwide, and indeed of Britain and Europe have shown, which is we've got to just get our heads around land use. We can't just allow land use to drift or, or to go according to market logic. Market logics are distorting. Uh, there is big investment uh, uh, of Silicon Valley money. There's basically a wall of cash. I've been to meetings of those sort of people. Um, uh, fair enough, they've got walls of cash. Um, but that money could be used in different ways. It could be invested in regeneration. It could be invested in rewilding. It could be invested in retreeing. Uh, as the great Hoskins said in uh, uh, his books 40 years ago, there's only one natural landscape in Britain, and that's Dartmoor. Uh, you know, I used to farm in the north, um, well, it was uh, sort of north, west, west Yorkshire, far northwest Yorkshire, just below the Lake District. Uh, but the county lines changed, and it was Lancashire in the forest of Boland. And our moors, you know, where I put sheep, we had 2,000 acres of of common land we put sheep in the winter that should just be rewilded it should be rewilded uh it would be much more useful to do that than to keep it as currently it is for grouse shooting um so that needs money there's lots of use for money uh for carbon sinks for sequestering water uh, uh for rethinking land use uh there is a wall of cash in britain and it's not got places to go that needs to be channeled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just looking down the... Uh, I'm just yeah, looking yeah, down... Sue uh, about food inequality and... Um, yeah, sheep. Sheep. The sheep question is a really good one. I mean, this is really big news whenever I... I was due to go to Senneth in Cardiff, but also couldn't because of lockdown. Um, you know, this is a debate that rumbles in the corridors there, you know, because so much of what Wales's policies have been about trying to keep sheep and sheep farming and keep the, the Welsh language going. You know, we've got to be more daring, more daring, and more imaginative, and doing it with people rather than against them. It's got to be done in a democratic way, which is why what you're doing your group uh, in Monmouthshire is so good. You're building up that culture of thinking, um, uh, which is why I was very happy to come and join you. I don't think I'm really being able to resolve, answer all of these things. No, I think... Uh... I'm trying to skip over them, I'm looking at them. Look, um, you're gonna have to go, I'm gonna have to go. Thank you very much for inviting me and I'm sorry if I'm um, not able to answer all the uh, or capture all the hairs I've set running. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't there's, think inevitably, there's, no, no, there's inevitably about, inevitability about that. No, it's yeah. Just, um, yeah, thank you very much, Tim, for a very interesting hour and ten minutes. Really interesting. Um, well, I hope that was of some use. And the slides, I saw someone earlier, I'm trying to scroll down the chat. Yeah, the slides are for you. So, uh, 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 Pa I sent them to Pam anyway in advance, I think. Uh, and, then I will, uh, and then I'll make sure that all the participants get them. Yeah. So that's, that's wonderful. Okay. 
Oh, thank you very much, Tim. And um, yeah. Okay, I'm now going to eat. I'm now going to eat my uh, my apple grown outside the room in which I'm talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Bye, my daughter. Great. Yeah. John. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. Okay. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye, Pam. Bye, bye, Kim. Bye, bye, Henry. Bye, bye, anyone who knows me. And hello, and thank you very much. I hope that was of some interest. Thank you very much for asking me. I'm going now. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.